this morning. We're going to lift up our voices. We're going to sing together and make a joyful noise. Amen.
we grateful to have a God that's willing to just take it all from us and trade it for joy, for good things, because he loves us. He is the king of glory. Amen. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. Awesome. Yeah, there's an awesome energy here this morning. Yeah. So I was thinking of the last song that we sang before this one. How we can trade our sorrows and our sickness with God for our joy, for joy, for a joy that only comes from Him. And, and I was thinking recently um, at work, and it seems that it's very popular now, a lot of people are getting into the stock market because the stock market crashed, right? And so people are getting a little bit of their savings and trying to invest to try to get some money back, to make, make a profit, an easy way to make a profit. And what I found out the hard way is that the stock market is just as ruthless as life. You cannot predict the stock market. You can read, you can research, and you can study. And before you know it, something happened, it goes the complete opposite way. 
And then all of a sudden, you find yourself frustrated because you invested some of your savings or a lot of your savings, if not all of your savings, into this one thing, and you were hoping that it would give you a profit, that it would go up, right? And I couldn't help myself to think, man, in life, we, we have one life, and we take aspects of our life, and we invest it here, and we invest it there, and we put a little bit of time here and a little bit of time there, and we hope that we would get a profit from it, right? You invest into your children so they can grow up in the ways of the Lord, you invest in your career so you can get something, uh, your 401k or your retirement, or something out of it in the future. And sadly, none of those things, we have no control over those things. Absolutely no control. And it doesn't matter how good of an investment sometimes you can make. You just, you just have no control over that. And it's crazy that you and I can invest our one life, we only have one life, into living for God and you are guaranteed guaranteed to get a hundred times fold in return not because of anything that you do but because of what God does through us because his grace carries us through in life and it's interesting and it's so fascinating and I love the theme that we have going on anchor in the storm that you and I can go through the storm and you and I can be reminded that it does not matter the storm that we find ourselves in our value does not decrease because you and I never did anything to end our value before God in the first place Jesus Christ died for you. And because Jesus Christ has died for you and for me, our value does not decrease or increase because of what you and I do. It is completely solidified because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. And sometimes at church, it can be discouraging or your spiritual life because things don't seem to go the way you want them to. And how encouraging that we can look to God and God will remind us that our life lived for him is not one that is ever wasted. It is never wasted. So I want to encourage you guys, if you're a believer, if you, if you have placed your trust in Jesus Christ, to be encouraged. Get a hold of the Lord. God longs for us to come at his feet and trade our sorrows for his joy, to come exactly as we are. And if you're a guest and if you're watching online and you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ today, this morning, we invite you to do just that. Jesus Christ came and died for your sins so you can have a relationship with him for all of eternity. So he can meet and satisfy all of your desires. Because you and I were created for him and by him. And only him and him alone can truly satisfy our souls. So if you're a guest, our hope as a church is that you would come to place your faith in Jesus Christ this morning. There is no better choice that you could ever make. And even though life will still continue to be ruthless. Because God, Jesus did tell us in John 16... I say these things so you may have peace. In this life, you will have tribulations. But take heart. I have overcome the world. It's not that the problems won't be there, but that Jesus will be there, and he is enough for us. Jesus is enough. He is enough for you and for me. And that is the invitation for all of us. And the reminder for all of us this morning is that Jesus Christ came for us to rescue us. And if you're a guest... We're so happy to have you guys here with us this morning. That is our hope as a church, our prayer as a church, that you would come to place your faith in Jesus Christ. We also have some announcements this morning. Please keep your mask on. <laughs> I just put it on. I don't know why I did that. Please keep your mask on at all times for your safety and that of the people around you. Try to keep some social distancing. You go to the bathroom, keep it on. Don't take it off. We also have groups. We encourage you guys to stay connected. Wednesday nights we have Bible lab, study through the word. Friday nights we have small groups. We dive into the word again. Again, invest your life in God's ways. There is no other way to invest your life. There's no better way to invest your life. And all these things the church makes available so that you and I can grow spiritually and closer to the Lord. We also have Financial Peace University, which is a class that teaches you about how to be responsible with your finances. So if you're interested in that, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, one of the leaders in the church. Um, and with that, I believe those are all our announcements. Okay, that's the website. If you're interested in Financial Peace University, therockmiami.com slash contact us. And there's a phone number there. With that, I want to encourage you guys also, before we pray for our tithes and offerings, you guys can give at therockmiami.com slash give or in the boxes by the door. With that, I'll ask you guys to bow your heads and close your eyes so we can pray. Father, we want to pray this morning, Lord, we thank you, God, that you are our hope, that you are our anchor, God, that you are our place of refuge, Lord. You don't turn anyone away, Father. God, thank you that we are reminded of how good you are through the songs, Father, through your word, 
how it is your mercy and your grace and your love that carries us through, Father. It is nothing that we do. It is not our performance, God. It is simply what you have done for us. What a king, what a God we have. Thank you, Lord. You have chosen us. You have died for us willingly. Father, went to that cross for us. But you saw us in our wickedness and you still died for us, Lord. God, sometimes it feels like we're no better today than we were when we started, Father. And it doesn't change the eyes of tenderness and love that you look down on us, Father, with. Because you see us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that your grace carries us through and through and through, God. And one day we will be in eternity, for all of eternity, singing your praise and your worship, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you are with us. You will continue to be with us, Father. We ask that you bless this morning, Father. Bless our tithes and our offerings, God. We give back to you the much that you have given to us, Lord. Father, we confess that we are undeserving people. And that you lavish and you pour your love on us, God. And we thank you for that. You're a good, good God, Father. We love you. We praise you. We ask that you bless this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So this next song is called The Way. And uh, yeah, like, like Axel said, this, this series is all about just having hope in the middle of the storm, you know? And, and, and even though it seems like everything's gonna fall apart or even though it seems like things are uncertain, everything is, is up in the air, nobody really knows what's happening or when this is gonna go uh, back to normal or, or if, <laughs> if normal's even gonna happen, you know? And, and we just, we, the, the best part about this, in, in, in this whole situation, beside the fact that, um, beside the fact that we get to wear masks and stuff, so I don't have to worry about people seeing my teeth if I don't brush them, <laughs> um, is just no. Realistically, like we can lean on God, we can lean on on Jesus, we can lean on the only way, the only truth, the only life. There's there's nothing else that is going to give us peace that that surpasses understanding that doesn't make sense in, this, in the middle of a storm. The same kind of peace that Christ that had, because he knows that when the seas obeys him, in the middle of the storm, he was asleep, but he was at the head of the boat. He knows what he's doing. He knows why he has us in this position, and he's been calling on your heart. He's been tugging on your heart. Listen to him. Listen to him above the sound of the wind and the waves. He's standing there talking to you. He's calling you. He's, he's begging you to listen to him so that he can show you the peace that he has for you peace that he has that can go through your mind and all your thoughts, all your doubts, all your anxiety and go directly into your heart and give you a warmth and a peace that you've never felt before. Brothers and sisters, let's go ahead and uh, join us as we sing this next song. I wanted to share one last thing. In, in Psalms 37, it says, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. That's verse 39. Father, we pray that you remind us that you are our stronghold in times of trouble.
and you keep us, Lord, from the storm. We thank you for this time, Lord, that we have the privilege of being here, Lord, healthy, Father God. And we can worship you, Lord, freely, Lord. We thank you for each and every one that's here, Father God. Continue to bless our lives, Lord. Continue to be our anchor, Father God. Help us, Lord, to fully trust in you, Lord. Help us to listen to your word, Lord, so that our faith can grow, Lord, and we can trust in you even more, Lord. We can trust that you are the way, that you are the life, Lord, that you are the truth, and that you will always be our anchor, Lord, in any situation that we go through, Lord. You are there for us, Father God. We thank you, Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for this life, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There is no better life. There is no better life. There is no better way. Thank you, Jesus, Lord. I'm so grateful, Lord. Be grateful. God is good. God is amazing. God is wonderful. Give him praise. Give him glory. Give him Give him worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. He is at the door. He is near. He is coming. Let's just look up because he is here. He is here. He's. Thank you, Jesus. What a day. Oh, what a day. Bless the speaker, Lord. Bless the word that we're about to receive. Lord, help us to treasure it in our hearts, Lord, and help us to share it, Lord, and put it to practice in our lives, Lord. Thank you, God. In the name of Jesus, I thank you and I pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, thanks, but that feels good. That feels good. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, because it's already the afternoon. It's already 12 o'clock. So you heard good morning. I was good afternoon. Thank you guys for coming here and it's nice to see your faces even though it's really half your face i see eyes but it's nice to see the eyes and for those of you that are home we miss you hope you guys can come soon and join us here in person i remember the last time i i actually preached i preached to an empty room and let me tell you that was weird that was so weird just looking at empty chairs and it was just it was just it's not the same as having you people, you beautiful people here with us this morning. So as you guys know, we're, we're in a series by the name of Anchor in the Storm. And this series began like four weeks ago and Pastor Sergio kicked us off in the series and, and he taught us and he showed us how the gospel is our anchor in our lives. Then Ralph went after that and he talked to us about when the waves come and he used the life of Joseph as an example for that. Then Jerry Jr. came up and, and he talked talk to us about having a tight grip to holding fast to our eternal life. And then last week, Sergio uh, talked to the married couples and, and the singles and just gave us some refreshment of, about where our anchor is. So I remember when we were talking about, about this series, um, and I don't remember, I remember we, we threw out ideas, and I want to say, Fernando, you're the one that came up with the verse for the series. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was one of the other guys. The verse that we, we chose to use for the series is Hebrews 6.19. Hebrews 6.19. I didn't give this to Carlos, but if you could put it up, that'd be great. <clears throat> and Hebrews 6.19 says, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. One of the gentlemen explained, I'll explain it again, what, what he's trying to say there. In the book of Exodus, we, we read how the temple was built and the temple was divided into two places, the most holy place and the holy of holies. Well, to go into the most holy place, you know, a, a priest would go in once a year and it was such a holy place that they would tie a rope to him in case he went in there and he didn't follow all the ceremonial laws, he would die and it was a way that they could pull him out because they weren't, necessarily allowed to go in there. So why is it that now we can have, we can enter in the inner place behind the curtain? And it was found in, in Jesus. 
Jesus, when he's crucified, at the very end, he says, it is finished. And when he says it is finished, that veil tears. When that veil tears, now we have access to God the Father. We no longer need a Levite priest to go into the temple for us to be able to pray, dear Heavenly Father. So the Genesis, Fern, I think it was you, yes? I know you don't want to take credit, but it's okay. Take the credit, bro. But I think it was him. So anyways, today our topic is hope in uncertain times. Hope in uncertain times. We are basically going to be looking at the life of Peter. We're going to be looking at him and some examples from Peter. And the the verse that the Lord gave me for this uh, sermon is 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9. If you guys can go with me, turn to 1 Peter 3 through 9, and I'm going to go ahead and read it. I'm going to read it, and then we're actually going to jump away from these verses, but I will come back to it at the end. So 1 Peter 3, 1, verse 3 through 9, I'm going to be reading from the ESV translation, and it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy... He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So this morning or this afternoon, better said, I really don't have any points, but if I were to have a first point, it would be this. Suffering causes uncertainty. And let's go to the end of verse six. The end of verse six says, you have been grieved by various trials. And you see, Peter understood. Remember that this was written after the gospel. So Peter understood how trials can cause uncertainty, how they can cause some suffering. So what I'd like to do is let's, take some exa- let's look at some examples from Peter's life, okay? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to be reading from verse 28, and I'll probably just read to the very beginning of verse 31, Carlos. I won't finish to 33. So Matthew 14, 28 says, And Peter said to him, Lord... If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, well, we're not going to, we'll just stop there. You know what is interesting about those verses? And maybe it's been said before, I'm not sure, but it was the first time that it really stuck out to me. And it's this, that he says that he saw the wind, not that he felt the wind. Because realistically speaking, we don't see the wind. We see what the wind does to an object. So if if we're outside and we see a tree or we see the flag moving, well, we know that there's wind because we see what it's doing. But I don't necessarily need to see the wind. I can go outside, I can close my eyes, and I can feel if there's wind without even seeing if there's anything going on. If there's any wind, I can feel the wind. But then why? Why did they use, why is the word used to see? He saw the wind. He saw the wind. And you know what I think it is? I think Peter got off that boat. And he started walking on that water. And when he initially starts walking on the water, his eyes are only on one thing. His eyes are on Jesus. His eyes are on Jesus. It's the moment that Jesus, that 
that Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus is that is when he sees the wind. Because from the moment he got off the boat, it, the Bible doesn't say that he got off the boat and it was a flat, calm day. That storm was still going. But he still got off the boat and was walking on the water. But it was the moment he took off his eyes off of Jesus is that he saw what was going on around him. He saw the chaos. He got scared. He had fear. He had uncertainty. And that moment that he started to sink, what happened? Jesus stuck out his hand. And I'm here for you. I got you. And pulled him out and saved him. I mean, you want to talk about fear in that very moment? You want to talk about losing hope in, that, in the midst of that type of uncertainty? I mean, that's got to be pretty scary. I remember, um, this was a few years ago. It was, we were in the Keys, and it was Chris, myself, and Louis. And they will remember this story. We were going to go spearfishing, and a wise man by the name of Freddy Perez was there, our pastor, or one of our pastors. He looked up at the sky, and he goes, I don't think you guys should go. We, being young and dumb, ah, we just go around the storm, go around the storm. So we decided to go out on the, uh, on the boat. And let me tell you, after we passed the channel, we started getting into a little bit of open water. There was no way we were, our idea, which the storm was coming this way, we were going to go around it. There was absolutely no way. I mean, the winds and the waves just started crashing us. I remember I was sitting on top of the boat, and it felt like if I literally just jumped in the water, because we went up and hit a wave, and just everything came on top of me. And I remember turning around, or when, I better say, because I was looking at Chris, Chris was driving the boat, I remember when I can actually see because the salt water left my face. I remember looking at Chris, and Chris is, Chris is pretty white, and he was white. I mean, he was like, I think we should turn around. I'm like, go back, go back. But so, you know, the, the, the ocean, and, and it's a scary place. It's a scary place. And, and at this point, Peter has already spent time with, uh, with Jesus. They've been together. They've traveled together. They eat together. They pray together. He learns who Jesus is and who he, what he's come to fulfill. He tell, Jesus tells him what it is that he's got to go through. I mean, Jesus makes some very strong claims about himself, um, particularly in the, in the book of John. Um, there's seven I am's uh, that he calls himself. He calls himself, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, which we just sang. And I am the true vine. Now, these weren't just, you know, regular claims that Jesus was saying about himself. I mean, for someone to say those things, you're saying some really big things about who you are. And just the fact that he's calling himself the I am goes back to Exodus and where where Moses comes to the burning bush, which is God that speaks to him, and God gives Moses a job. God gives Moses a commission of what he needs to do, which is to go and free his people. And Moses asks a very wise question. When I go to Pharaoh, who do I say sent me? I mean, it's not like Moses is going to go up to Pharaoh and go, hey, listen, uh, let the people of Israel go, and Moses is just going to laugh at him. I mean, sorry, Pharaoh is just going to laugh at him. No, but God tells him that the I am Tell, tell Pharaoh that the I am that I am, that uh, the I am that I am has sent you, the self-existing one. And Pharaoh listened. I mean, he was still hard-headed, and obviously we know the whole story of what Pharaoh did. But um, yeah, so he was a hard-headed guy. It's interesting that we saw, sang that song, "I Am the Way, the Truth, and the Life," at the beginning of of that chapter, which is John chapter fourteen. I love the way John starts off this, this chapter. It's with six beautiful words. And it says, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Maybe you're thinking, wow, those, those, those are beautiful words, but, but how? How can I not let my heart be troubled? Are you kidding me? I mean, my life, I, I can't even explain to you how hard it has been so lately. As a matter of fact, I'm the complete opposite of that verse. Why is my heart so troubled today? Why don't I have any hope? Why is following God so hard? 
And if I were to open up this room to questions like that, we could probably be here all day. Because I don't know what every single one of you are going through. But I know we're all going through something like this. Because it's just the nature of life. We're all on that same boat. All of us are in that same boat thinking, why, why is this so hard? And these are all good and valid questions and, and it's hard. All right? And we, we would maybe think that if anyone had it all together, it would be Peter, right? I mean, he spent time with Jesus. He was saved you know, from the boat. I mean, he was constantly with them. If anyone's going to be brave in the midst of the fear and the uncertainty, it would be Peter, right? It would have to be him. No, wrong. Now, Peter did have his moments of bravery. I mean, he did get out of the boat. That's in the middle of a storm to get out of a boat. That takes some bravery. But he also had his moments where the fear and the uncertainty and the hopelessness were too big for him. You guys remember, well, if we look a few chapters ahead, you've read your Bible, you know what eventually happens in the ending chapters of any of the Gospels. What does Peter do? Peter denies even being a follower or even knowing Jesus. He just denies. He just says, oh, I don't know him. But what happened? Because if you guys remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, who was it that pulled out the sword and struck the, the soldier? It was Peter. But what happened? What happened from that moment to the moment when they said, oh, aren't you one of the followers? He saw the reality of what was, was going to come. Suffering, all that fear, all that anxiety. What did it do? It made him cower and say, I don't even know this Jesus. And we know what eventually happens, right? Jesus goes to the cross, and he's crucified, and he dies. Now imagine for one second what Peter and the apostles were going through. You want to talk about uncertainty, about what is going on in that very moment? You want to be, talk about being left in limbo? Their question has to be, now what? Now what? This guy who claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the bread of life, is now gone. He's gone. Again, luckily we know what happens. We know, the, we know what the rest of the Bible says. It says that three days later, Jesus resurrects and everything changes. Everything changes. In Acts chapter 1, we see um, after some time of him being alive and showing himself to, to many people, we know that he ascends. And towards the end of Acts chapter 1, you already see a different Peter. You see a different Peter. And we know that in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon them as fire. And now Peter, this guy who didn't know Jesus, now stands up and gives this rousing and amazing speech or sermon, whatever you call it. And we know the end of Acts chapter 2 tells us that 3,000 souls came to know Jesus Christ. Maybe today you're feeling, wow, that, that's, those, that, those, are, those are stories, yeah, and those are, I know those stories, I've heard them. And, and you say, but realistically, Alfred, I, I, I'm losing hope today. I have so much fear, I have so much uncertainty. Have you seen what the last five months have been? I mean, we've never ever gone through something like this. But not just the last five months. For some of us, we were going through stuff, better said, for all of us, we were going through stuff before that. This just added to it. Could be that maybe you've misplaced your hope in the government, thinking that the government is going to be the end all, be all, and that is what's going to save me. That is what's going to give me hope. I'm going to put my hope in that. Maybe it's that. Maybe you have marital problems. Maybe you have financial health problems. 
Maybe it's fear and uncertainty and anxiety, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That list, again, would probably go on for quite some time. And you see, in uncertain times, our circumstances, although I know they, they get us worried and cause fear and anxiety, we need to be reminded who's in control. And it's God. You see, we can trust and we can be certain that there is a sovereign God who is intimately involved in everything that is happening right now and that he cares. You see, as Christians, we are not deists, right? Deists believe that God created the world and he stepped back and he said, whatever happens, let it be. It's just going to work itself out. No, 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 that's not, that's not at all what we believe. The truth is that he's an intimately involved in your life and in my life and that he cares for you. James 1 tells us to cast all your cares on him. Psalm 23.3 says that he restores our souls. There is nothing on planet earth that can do that to you. Nothing. The only one who can restore your soul is God. And because of that, you can have hope. And then this hope can give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. Now let's think about that. How is that even possible? The peace that surpasses all understanding. How can we have peace in the middle of all the suffering and the uncertainty. You know, and I, as I thought about that question, you know, a lot of times, you know, we go to psychologists, and I'm not saying psychologists are bad or any of those things are bad, but we go to outside sources to try to find that peace. And as I thought about that question, the only thing I could come up with was very simple. We keep our eyes on the gospel, which is our living hope. You see, when Peter got off that boat, since he kept his eyes on Jesus, he didn't notice all the things that were going on around him. He didn't notice the waves and, and all the stuff that was going. And it's the same for us. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, doesn't mean that the chaos isn't here and it's not around us and above us. It's still there. It's still there, but when we keep our eyes on Jesus, he gets, it, he gets us through it because he cares for you, because he can restore your soul. That is what he's here to tell you this morning. I care for you. I am your hope. It was finished on the cross. We have victory in the resurrection, and that is our gospel. You see, and Peter comes to an understanding that there is a hope for us all, and not just any hope, but a living hope. And let me tell you, there is a difference between hope and living hope. They're, they're not one and the same. They are different. You see, I can hope that when I leave here today, I get Mexican food. But my wife might want burgers. I can hope that, but it might not happen. A better example is there is a lot of religions in this world and they all hope that what they believe is the truth. They all hope that what they believe is right. Oh, but not Christianity. You see, Christianity is the only religion in the world that can say that we have a living hope. Because you see, our Savior, like Axel was saying, came to this earth, in the flesh, died on a cross, it didn't end there, he rose again, and not right now, at this very moment, he sits at the right hand of the Father. So we can have a living hope, not just a regular hope. Because all those other hopes will fade away, but not this hope. This hope is eternal. That is hope. That is a real living hope. Now let's jump back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's jump back to 1 Peter chapter 1. 
Again, I don't really have points, but if I were to have another point, it would be suffering and uncertainty brings you to hope in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to read uh, verses 3 and verse 4, and then we're going to jump to verse 9 a little bit further. So I'm going to read verse 3 and 4 again. Blessed, before I read that, let me say something else. I think Peter was able to write this because of what he had lived through and what he went through and what he had seen. He had gone through fear. He had gone through uncertainty. He, he had a lot of the things that we go through. He was, he, he went through it. And I'm sure even after this, he still went through those things. But then he gets to first Peter one. And this is what he says. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Again, you see the difference between the hope and the living hope? We have that living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead because he has defeated the grave. To an inheritance that is imperishable, it is undefiled, and it is unfading, kept in heaven for you. Those are some beautiful words that Peter pens in 1 Peter chapter 1. After all that being said, he's drawn to a conclusion about his and our salvation and what our inheritance is not, okay? What our inheritance is not. What is our inheritance? What are the three words that he uses to describe our inheritance? You see, because I can leave an inheritance to my kids But that inheritance, when they pass away, their inheritance is gone. And they can do the same thing for their kids. And when their kids pass away, that inheritance is gone. It's left with somebody else. But here's how he describes the inheritance that we get from God. It is imperishable. I know they're fancier words, but simply said, it's everlasting. It is undefiled. In other words, it's undamaged. It's brand new. And it is unfading. Again, it's everlasting. You see, our inheritance, because of this living hope that we believe in, is eternal. And that alone is what should cause us to have a living hope. We have a hope because it is eternal, eternally found in Jesus Christ. And then if we jump to verse 9, Carlos, if you put up verse 9, after he he pans, and remember in verse 6, he talks about how he was going to go through, you know, through uh, different trials. He comes to what is the reward of of, of this enduring of suffering and anxiety and uncertainty? It's obtaining the outcome of your faith. Obtaining the outcome of your faith in Jesus It's what? The salvation of our souls. It is the salvation of our souls. I'd like to call up uh, Danny and Harrison at this time. You know, it's funny that I named or titled the sermon Hope in Uncertain Times. If I'm going to be honest with you guys, I find the title for the sermon somewhat paradoxical, somewhat, um, can't think of the word, um, contradictory, contradictory. And that's not, I'm not Miss Cleo or Walter Mercado, okay? I'm just going to make that very clear, okay? Um, I, I don't know what's going to happen 30 seconds from now, five minutes from now, an hour, a day, a month, a year. I don't know what's going to happen. But if we've read the Bible and you've read it all the way through Revelation, we do know what's going to happen. We have victory. 
we have victory. Doesn't mean we're not gonna have problems. Listen, the problems are gonna be there. I think Axel mentioned today, John 16, 33. He tells you that you're gonna have various trials. You're gonna have problems. The problems are gonna be there no matter what. It's going to always be there because as long as we're alive and in this body and in this flesh, we're going to have issues. We're going to have problems. That is not, uh, maybe it's gonna happen. No, that is a one hundred percent guarantee that we're going to have problems but be of good cheer because he has overcome the world you can have hope in the midst of the problems you can have hope that my life has fallen apart but wait there's someone who gives us hope who gives us a living hope and that is jesus christ that is what the gospel is for each and every one of us here this morning you know i asked my my daughter, Samantha, to give me her definition of hope. I didn't write this for her. My wife didn't write this for her. This was her definition that she wrote and texted me. Okay? It was from, she texted me from my wife's phone. She wrote to me, what hope means to me? Here it is. Hope is the light at the end of every tunnel, no matter how long it is. It's peace you can have when you have Jesus Christ in your heart. To know that even though life is but a vapor and that I can live today but die tomorrow, I will have the hope that I will go to heaven and live forever. To me, hope is Jesus. He is the happy and the sad. He is the good and the bad. He is the strength and the weak He is the love when there is hate. He is the right and the wrong, and he is the light at the end of every tunnel. To me, that tunnel is our life. Our life is dark, dirty, and sinful. But for us believers, we have light at the end of the tunnel, which is heaven. We can have a hope that in the end of our life, we will have a light, which is Jesus Christ. To me, That's hope. I thought those were pretty strong words for an 11-year-old. And as I remember talking to my wife about, about what she said. And, and she goes to me, you know, you know why she can say those words? And I honestly didn't know. I honestly, I had no idea. She says, it's because she's had to suffer. She's had uncertainty. She's had anxiety. She's had fears to be able to understand that kind of hope. So I ask you this morning, to who? To what are you going to turn to? Is it going to be drugs? Is it going to be alcohol? Work? Or insert whatever it is that you would turn to in the midst of this uncertainty. I tell you, no. We don't turn to any of that. We turn to the only one who can give us a living hope. We turn to Jesus Christ. We turn to the gospel for everything. Struggle against the wind. Seen the 
the dark in the broken places home oh, I don't know when my soul no matter how bad it gets I mean There's a place at the end of the storm you finally find Where the hurt and the tears and the pain fall behind You open up your eyes and up ahead there's a big sun shining Right then and there you Yes, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of problems, in the midst of the chaos that goes on around us, that we can have hope and that you are our hope. I just ask you, Lord, that you comfort every single one of us this morning. Every single one. You know exactly what it is that every single person is going through, struggling with this morning. I just ask you that you comfort them. Do what Psalm 23 3 says, Lord. Restore their souls. Give them that peace. Help us to keep our eyes on you. 
Help us to keep our eyes on you and not the chaos that goes on around us. Guide us, Lord. We thank you that you are such a good, good God. And we thank you that we have victory. Let us not walk around like it is over. Let us not walk around with our heads down. Remind us that we are victorious in you. You are our living hope. We thank you. We bless you. And we honor you, Lord. And we ask you all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys for coming. See you Sunday. And if you get together with your groups, well, enjoy that too. God bless you. Have a good weekend. Go get Mexican. <laughs>